Hi everyone, thank you for watching our program. Don't forget we're here every week. Feel free to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to share. Enjoy the program. Hello and welcome to today's Love Talk with me, Helena. And with me, James. Now today we're talking about a very serious topic. We're talking about forced marriages and honor killings. Mm -hmm. I think the general consensus is that uh, forced marriages may be more common in the UK than most people think. Mm -hmm. I think this doesn't get enough uh, press attention, enough media attention, and so we tend to think that it doesn't really happen that much. But we, we are finding that reality is different. And today, we'll be exploring this topic. Now, if you'd like help and information, or if you are in any danger, the details of the organizations and people you can contact will be shown on your screens below throughout the whole show today. And of course, you can also contact us and we can help you. Just email us on questions at lovetalkshow.tv mm -hmm. and we will get back to you. But first, here's what's coming up in today's program. Coming up on today's show, we'll be answering some of your most intriguing questions on dating in this week's Dear Love Talk, so make sure you keep those questions coming in. On this week's One Minute Bulletin, we'll be highlighting one of the latest studies about couples and where they sleep. Plus, we have a fantastic Love Talk regulars, including this week's Trip for Two, where our new couple, Tapiwa and Yasmin, will be learning how to make some sushi at the Sozai Cooking School in London. Now, back to our important topic today, we'll be speaking to producer Aram Essen, who recently created a short documentary called Death by Dishonor, which delves into the unspoken subject of honor killings in order to raise awareness about these increasing problems. And later on, we'll be showing an exclusive first look at that piece on the show. On top of that, we have the real life story of Shazia Hobbs, who's been in the public eye recently, but this time she'll be bravely sharing her horrifying personal experience with forced marriage. Do not miss this. We have a full pack show, so let's get started. Back to you, James and Helena, for this week's Dear Love Talk. Hello and welcome to Dear Love Talk, the part of the program where every week we answer your questions. If you want to get in touch, then send us an email to questions at lovetalkshow.tv and we'll answer your questions right here. Now the mm -hmm. first question comes from someone who contacted us via Facebook and the person said, I've been dating someone who I have met online for the past nine months. Mm. He has come to see me where I live, but until today, every time I'm supposed to go and see him at his hometown, something always comes up and he calls it off. Up until today, I have not met any of his family or friends. How do I deal with this? You should deal with this very carefully. <laughs> because if he uh, dodges you coming to see him, that's a very negative sign. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, uh, the things, a sign that a relationship is moving forward and is healthy is when you get to know the person's family and, and friends and work environment and hobbies. It's an integral part of a relationship moving forward. If you have been dating for nine months and you've not yet entered that stage, then the truth is that it's not much of dating going on. Not to mention the fact that it's not that there's a possibility he's lying to you, is that it's a dead given that he's lying to you. Because if he doesn't want you to come and see him for a period of one year and you've offered to do so, so many times, then something's not right and he must be hiding something. Well, he, he's not coming across, well, he didn't say he didn't, he didn't want her to meet the family, but he's always busy Making or excuses something happened. Mm, well, that doesn't sound too right to me. Yeah. I think you should maybe do a surprise visit. 
he should have an address, so maybe, listen, if you ask him what's your address, I want to send you a, a card or something, <laughs> then you just show up, let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, I think that's the only thing you can do. But, but it doesn't sound right. Yeah, and the reality is that you going forward with this relationship or trying to push this relationship forward, would you just be trying to avoid the inevitable? Because at some point you're going to find out that he's hiding something from you. He's probably hiding a double life. And, you know, you're just trying to pretend that this is not the case by just plodding along. So you, yeah. the two options you have here is to say, look, you either come clean or come and see your family, come and see your friends and, and we see where the relationship goes or then call it off. Because, you know, whenever there are things hidden, then there's a reason for you not to trust that person. Maybe mm -hmm. it's better for you to move on. And, and just the fact that you wrote to us and, and asked us this question, already shows that you have a concern, that you are worried, you know there's something wrong. So sometimes we should trust our instincts, you know, trust in a way, okay, this is not normal and do what you have to do. That's right. Basically. Next question. It you. says, I dated someone for four years and we are planning, we were planning our wedding. Last week I found out she had a son who is 18 years old. She didn't come forward to tell me this. I happened to find out through someone else. I feel like a fool. How could I not uh, see this before? I am at a crossroad and don't know if I should still go ahead and get married. I understand why you feel like a fool. And I am sorry this happened to you, but this is something that is quite common. If there is a lack of communication throughout the period, of dating or if you are not respecting that period and you're not doing what you should be doing which is to actually get to know one another why am I saying this let me explain because these days people they get busy with with all sorts of things apart from doing what they need to do which is to talk a lot visit family members, you know, socialize with each other's family, getting to know how he treats his mom, how she treats her family, and find out a few things. And maybe you, you got distracted along the way because it's, it's very difficult, although we know that there are some professional liars out there, very professional, uh, it, it would be difficult for you not to see that something was wrong. Uh, because if she has a daughter um, or a son, I don't know if it was a son, a son yeah. 18 years old son, then she's surely a more, she's already a mature person. She's not in her 20s. So just that alone, if you're dating someone who, is, uh, who has passed their 40s or 50s, there is a history there. There, there has to be a story that comes with the package. So you need to know all about but, it. But I think, I think we have a bigger problem here. Tell okay? us. Enlighten us. <laughs> because, you know, the problem is not that she has a son. It's not a problem if, if you're dating someone and the person has a son. But the person lied to you. They lied to you the fact that they have a son. This is a pretty big deal. That's it's not a, a deal breaker. It's actually. not a minor deal. And it's not because it's a deal breaker because she has a son. It's a deal breaker because she never told you. Because maybe had she come forward and said, listen, from the beginning of the relationship, look, I want you to know that you have a son. <clears throat> if you marry me, if you commit to me, you're going to be committing to this, this young man as well that I have as a son. That is different. And who's to say that you wouldn't have made a decision to carry on with a relationship because you love this person? But the truth is someone hiding from you such an important part of their life. Something's not right about this person's character. Mm -hmm. I, you need to ask yourself the question, is this the kind of person you want to live the rest of your life with? Because if someone lies to you about having a son, they can lie to you about anything else. They can lie to you about whether they have another man in her life. So I, I think, you know, maybe, I think the problem here, Lynn, is that maybe he'll say, well, but if I break the relationship off, if I call off the wedding, she'll say it's because, oh, you only broke up with me because I had a son. Because if you loved me, you would accept us. Mm -hmm. But that's not the issue. It's not the issue of having a son. It's the issue that the person lied to mm -hmm. you. And any relationship that is based on lies, whether it's because of a son or because of a, a, another boyfriend or, or whatever it is, it's not going to work. So you going forward with this, you are going forward with something that you know 
this person may lie to you again. And if you do decide to go forward, then you have to be very blunt and clear to say to this person, you cannot do this to me again. Mm -hmm. But then again, who's to say she's not going to do it again? Because she didn't come clean and say, I have a son. You I found out through it. someone else. Yeah, I so you have it. to be very careful. And mm -hmm. like I said, it's not because she has a son. That's not the problem. It's a problem of the lies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it may be an embarrassing situation if you call this off. But better to call it off and build a better future than having to deal with a much bigger explosion of problems in the future. Yeah, it's like you're building your life uh, on the on on the sand on the sand. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, you will always be worrying: Is she telling the truth? Yeah. Who is this person? Oh, he's a cousin. Is so, he really a cousin? Yeah. So you the, don't know. The, the problem here is not lack of communication; it's lies. She lied to you, and that's yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. Okay. We hope that we could, uh, we've could, we managed to help with these questions. And if you are in this situation, hopefully this has enlightened you as to what to do with your situation. If you want to get in touch, send us your any questions you have to questions at lovetalkshow.tv or you can also contact us via Facebook. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye. If getting to know someone in person and seeing them face to face is already difficult. Imagine when you're getting to know someone online and somehow the person uh, dodges you and, and dodges the opportunity of meeting you at any chance they can. Something's not right. Of course, there's something wrong there. <laughs> but anyway, if you really want a very frank, sincere opinion from us. Frank you, is the key word, very it frank. Is. So <laughs> you know what to do, you know, get in touch. Absolutely. Now let's head over to our Love Talk correspondent, Jenny Cortez Ibanez, for this week's News Bulletin. Hello and welcome to this week's One Minute Bulletin. According to a recent study by sofa company DistinctiveChesterfields.com, an astounding 10% of British couples sleep in separate beds. And what are the reasons for this exactly? Well, this research says that more than a quarter of British couples say snoring is the main factor forcing them to sleep alone followed by rows. The data also showed 39% of Brits argue with their partner once a week or more, with an average argument lasting two hours and five minutes. However, they resulted in a fifth of couples sleeping apart for at least two days. The data also showed results that over 55s were the most likely to let bad blood linger, with one in six sleeping alone for three nights or longer, whereas the 18 to 24 year olds claimed to have things worked out before bedtime. The study also revealed that untidiness was the biggest reason for couples arguing, followed by money, driving and family. Men were more likely to complain about their partner's driving, housework or what to watch on telly, whereas women were more concerned with the frequency of their partner going out and money issues. The most common place to sleep following an argument is the spare room with 35.7%, followed by on the sofa 32.1% and oddly in the bath with 7.5%. Women appeared to be firmer, with one in five saying it would be their partner who was made to sleep elsewhere. These figures come from a survey of 2,000 people and director at the firm, Steve Laidlaw, said. As our data shows, arguments can have a real effect on the state of our marital beds, and it's shocking to see that one in 10 couples are sleeping alone. When we think of our beds, we imagine a safe place to relax at the end of a hard day. Couples should always try to resolve disagreements before going to bed. If you do, you'll find you can get a much better night's sleep. And that's all for this week's One Minute Bulletin. See you again next week. And that's exactly why we always say in our marriage course, Elena, that you don't go to bed with unresolved problems. It's true. But it seems like the older couples are the ones that tend to do this the most, apparently. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sad. And who knew that you could sleep in a bath? <laughs> That's a new one for me. Well, maybe it happened so often they had to get creative. But don't give up. I mean, you've, you've fought so much to find someone, you know, your other half. Don't, don't give up. And it's strange. Do you, do, you think that, do you think that men uh, let women stay in the bed 
because women say, I claim this space, it's mine, or is it because men are chivalrous even when they are having arguments? Somehow... I don't think so. I don't think it matters. But I don't <laughs> just, think so. Just don't go to bed with unresolved issues. <laughs> okay? Oh, now we're going to go to a break. When we come back, we'll be hearing the story of Shazi Hobbs, who experienced firsthand forced marriage, yeah. but who's in a very different place in her life. You'll get to hear her amazing story right after this break. Hi everyone, thank you for watching our program. Don't forget we're here every week. And click here to subscribe so you can watch all our upcoming programs and never miss one. Welcome back. As you know, we're talking about forced marriages and honor killings. And mm -hmm. it, it's been um, not easy to find someone who's been comfortable enough to come on the program and talk about their experience. But we do have someone here who came all the way from Scotland to be with us in the studio today. And I want to introduce you to Shazzy Hobbs. Shazzy, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for so coming much. down. Indeed. Um, I know it's not a, an easy topic to talk about. And a, a lot of people don't feel comfortable enough to, to, to share their experience. In your ex can you tell us a little bit about why you're here and, and what you've been through in terms of, of today's topic, forced marriages? I've been through a forced marriage. Um, I was 18 when I was forced into a marriage. I grew up in a polygamous Muslim household. Okay. My dad is from Pakistan. He was married, first wife, Pakistani wife, and met my mum, who's Scottish, and all lived in the same house. And forced marriage was just something that was that was normal. It was you seen other people in the family, you saw people in the wider community getting forced into marriage. It, it's just normal. So it's like part of the culture. It's part of culture. Yeah. It's just so you, you grew up. Let me see if I, if I got this right. You grew up in a house with your dad. And, and two wives. Two wives. In the same house? Yes. D did this seem normal to you as you of were growing course. up? Of course, yeah. You don't know anything else. So right. Yeah, true. You, you get used you to get the used environment to it. You, and all that. You, as you get older, you realise that it's not normal because none of your friends have two mums right. living at home. But when you're younger, it's just normal. So yeah. you, you said you, you were forced into a marriage at 18. W what got you to that point? I mean, uh, because you, you having a Scottish mother, right? Yeah. Um, w was your upbringing not a little bit more European? Was no. it more to the Pakistani side? It was more strict. I think having having the white mum, it was more strict because then you know how do I explain it? We weren't allowed to do as much because our mum was white, okay. so then nobody could talk about you and, oh, it's the white woman's daughter and that's why they're wild, they're out of control. So it was a lot more strict. And, and how did you, when, when that moment came where you were forced to marry someone at that age, how did your mum feel about that? My mum had no choice. Right. Yeah, she just had to go along with what my dad said and to an extent my stepmom also. Mm. So tell us about that. How, how did that work out? At 18, I mean, oh. did you tell people at home what that was like? Horrible, the worst experience of my life. To, mm. to be forced to marry somebody you've never met, to meet him on your wedding night. So you've only, you, you only met that person the day you got married? On my wedding night, yeah. Was, was that here, was that in? In here, in, in, here. in Glasgow, yeah. Okay. Wow, but let me just ask you something. Growing up, you know, being a teenager and then all the way up to 18, I'm sure you liked boys. someone, yeah, boys, <laughs> at school, college, and, but also living in a traditional home like that, didn't you, weren't you like prepared, like, oh, you know, you've got to, we'll find your husband, I mean, I know that sometimes we hear our parents say, oh, you're going to have to do this when you grow up, but you don't really, you know, pay much attention, mm -hmm. but did you... Um, did that frighten you or didn't you just pay much attention to You don't to that? pay much attention to it because you think it's so far away and... Mm. So you don't really... You, know, oh, you, see other, you see other people in the family getting married and Pakistani brides are always miserable and it's possibly because they have been forced into a marriage but you don't ever see yourself as being that bride that one day you're going to be sitting there miserable. So at 18 you're married, you just met this person on your wedding night 
from the moment you got married onwards, what was your life like? Hell. He married for the passport and I was forced to marry. So I had no choice but to marry him, but he, he married me to get the red passport. So there was no love there. Well, there well, was no love from your side, neither his? No, neither his, you, no. Did you ever try to, to love this person, to learn to love this person, or you, you didn't even try? We just to... didn't have anything in common at all. Right. I, I know that, well, I mean, because I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm like trying to imagine what it's like. Because you do see it in the movies and documentaries, and I, I hear it from you, but it's always difficult to imagine what it's like to meet someone like that will be mm. your, your husband on, on your wedding night. It's like, wow. So you, you got married, and then what? Did you, you, did, did you start fighting soon, or did you, did, did you talk to each other? I mean, I can imagine, like, was it awkward? Oh, of course, I, this sounds like a Awkward silly question. Yeah, yeah, like it. yeah, it's just, just, it just happens. It's what you're, again, goes back to culture. So mm. you just so seen as normal. have to get on with it. You just have to put up, I suppose. And, and mm. how long did the marriage last for? And, and what did you do to get out of that? Because I imagine there was a lot of pressure from your family. What yeah. was the process of, of getting out of that? The marriage lasted marriage? too long. Too um, long, how long? Not even three years, but that was too long. Of course, for a person living in that situation is yeah. a, mm -hmm. a long time. And I think the turning point was he had friends over, distant relatives, and one of them had said to him to not speak to me like I was dirt. Just some stranger telling him to, she's your wife, treat her with respect. And I left him the next day. Right. Wow. Now, I think the next question is, because I think the main point is, we want to know what gave you strength for you to leave the marriage and what mm -hmm. the process was. But, you know, how common is this here in the UK? Because. You hear about it sometimes, you hear about forced marriages, you hear about honor killings, but it's very sporadic, you don't hear it a lot. And it's either because the media doesn't give it enough attention, and that's why mm -hmm. perhaps we're doing this program to raise awareness to this problem, or it's because it doesn't happen that often. In your view, how common is this? It's very common, yeah. I think it happens a lot. And many even go through a lot of abuse. Yes. Mm. We hear that a lot, so imagine just to leave a marriage like that, it's even dangerous, isn't it? For some, was, yeah. For some, so I'm like... Well, I, was, I was very fortunate that I didn't fear for my life when I left him or <clears throat> have to go into hiding or leave Glasgow. I stayed in Glasgow, I didn't have okay. to go and move to a different part of the country. You, I mean, you didn't fear for your life, but did you, when you... I mean, did you flee the marriage and were you treated as the black sheep of the family? Were you oh, yeah. disowned? What, yeah, what disowned. was that experience like? Yeah, I was disowned for, for choosing to leave and for choosing to take control of my own life and to make my own choices. How, how did you deal with trying to get your life back, getting your confidence back? What was that process like? What was the key thing for you? Well, oh, I don't know. It took a long, long time because when you're disowned, you're not just disowned from family, you're disowned from the entire community. So everything I knew was Pakistani. That was the culture I had been brought up in. And then to be disowned by the whole Pakistani community and, mm -hmm. and try to fit in to a white culture that I didn't really know anything about. So you, you jumped from like a Pakistani culture and mm -hmm. background to a, a completely different yeah. culture. Yeah. And um, I imagine it must have been very a very lonely time in your life in a way because you didn't have people that you were used yeah. to having around you. Mm -hmm. What is? I know there are people watching us now who are in the situation that you were. In, in your experience, what is the most important thing to try to escape a relationship like that that may be abusive, that may be dangerous? What should people do? What are the steps to take? Phone, phone, phone the, a charity that that can help. Um, just phone somebody, get help, don't, don't suffer in silence, mm -hmm. break the silence, well, call somebody. What if the person is really scared of phoning someone and believes that no help will come? Because we do hear that a lot. Yeah. You know, oh, we, we, I never called because, you know, I was afraid someone would come home and want to talk to my husband or something like that. So, I mean, what would you, you say? You can email that? as well. You can, you can build up a 
not a relationship, but build up with somebody in a charity mm -hmm. and email mm -hmm. somebody okay, but and get advice through, through emails if you're too scared to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. But not to remain in that kind of situation, right? No, there's help. Get yeah. out. Okay. I mean, looking back now, you're, you're a very, I would say, different person because you've grown and you've become stronger. Uh, I imagine you're happy you've made that decision. How, how are you today compared to how you were? At 18. At 18, when you were forced into that marriage? It's so different. They would never, ever, in a million years, be able to force me into marriage today. Right. And you, you believe you've made the right decision? Totally, yes. Okay. Mm. So I, I think the important thing is, because there is, there is another factor to people who don't feel comfortable enough to make that decision to walk away, and, and there is the danger element, but there is also the element that you're letting your family down, that you're letting your, you're disappointing your parents, you're disowning your culture. And I, I think sometimes people are afraid, but the, the, the important part to remember, I don't know if you agree mm -hmm. with me, is that it, it has to get better. If you leave, if you walk away from a marriage that you were forced into, it has to get better. No matter how difficult it will be in the beginning, the future has to be brighter, right? It has to, yeah. It is. It, it is. <laughs> There's no has to be about it. It is. Yeah. It does take time. Mm -hmm. um, how long did it take you to recover? Like you left and then you started a new life. How long did it take you to... Because I don't know, do you, it takes do you speak to your family no. today or they're completely... Completely gone. Okay. Yeah. But you, you, do you feel that you've been able to build yourself off, up completely uh, in spite of not having them yeah, around? Yeah, you do, you do miss family, of course you do. It, it'd be a lie to say that you don't. Mm. And it can, be, it can be strange to be in situations and not have any family around. Like I got married two years ago and nobody from my side of the family was at the wedding. So times like that. Mm -hmm. um, but being happy is more important. Yeah, and than, you, yeah. are you happy now? Yes, very happy. That's great. Shazia, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the program and thank sharing you your do. story. Thank you. Thank and you. for making the trip all the way, all the way here to <laughs> London from Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And if you are going through a situation similar to what Shazia has gone through, remember you don't have to suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. Get in touch with someone. And sometimes you feel, but what if the person I'm talking to uh, cannot solve my problem? It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you don't suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised at what can come out of a conversation. Sometimes you talk to someone who will understand what you're going through, empathize with your situation, and will help you to move forward from where you are. Now we have to go for a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to see an interview we did earlier with Iram Essen, a producer who did a documentary on honor killings. You won't want to miss it. Hi everybody, we hope that you are enjoying today's program. Did you know that we hold weekly seminars every Saturday at 7 p.m.? That's right, come and join us at the Rainbow Theatre in Finsbury Park. Admission is free, we'd love to see you there. Welcome back. You had the privilege of listening to Shazia Hobbs' story earlier yeah. and how she managed to start a new life, but at a price. And I think it's important mm -hmm. to, to underline this, that you, you can start a new life, but there's always a price to pay as there is for anything that's good in life. Yeah, and also there are also always marks that are left. Mm -hmm. But you know what? People who manage to move forward, it, it's really... How can I say, it's, it's inspiring to be mm -hmm. around people like this because it's not everyone that chooses to, to take those marks and, and turn them into something yeah. that, you know, this is who I am today because of this. It, it, didn't, it didn't destroy me, but it made yeah. me a stronger person. It made me a wiser person. So you, you so. may have a little bit to lose, but a lot to gain. And I think that's yeah. the positive side. <laughs> Now, some time ago, we caught up with Iram Essen, the producer of a documentary on honor killings, and she spoke to us about the people she interviewed and how common this problem is here in the UK. Here's her story.
Now, I'd like to introduce you to our guest today here in the studio, and I have here Iram Issen with us. Did I say your name correctly? Yes, you did. Welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank well, you. Now, you, you worked on a documentary recently called Death by Dishonor. Yeah. That deals with, um, it deals with forced marriages and honor killings. Yeah. We're, we're going to show you an edited version of this documentary because we wouldn't have time to show everything, and we'll come back to talk to you, Iram, about this very important topic. Have a look. Deep down, I knew what was happening to Sergio wasn't right. So I was trying to support him in some way. Um, yeah, I just did what I could do. There is no such thing as honour killing. Um, it's more to do with control and pressure and families making individuals behave in a certain way, how they should be, and taking away their freedom, their rights. Um, I think these vulnerable ladies or men who give up their lives um, have no choice. They push to the limit where they give up and lose their lives. Honour has been around forever, not just within the communities that we're talking about, predominantly that we support people when we talk about South Asian communities, Middle Eastern communities, etc. Um, Honour exists in England. You know, when you think about the royal family, and you think about how many arranged or forced marriages have happened in the royal family itself over the years. So honour is a very old, you know, it's an archaic word that's existed across many groups for many years. There's a lot of control when we were growing up, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what we could do, what we couldn't do. And that, you know, was taken with us when we got married into our new families. And you're just like um, caught up in that circle. So you just can't really um, go outside and be the person you really want to be. In particular, the honour is vested more in the women and there's more of a duty of the woman to carry the family honour, to carry the family name. So there is more pressure on her to conform and to behave in a way that is expected of her in comparison to, say, for example, a brother or, or her male counterpart, for example. So it does impact women more and it does impact women in a different way too. And we know a lot of victims that live a double life. We have victims that have two Facebook accounts, for example, one that the family can see and one that they can't see, the real them. Um, so it's really, really tough for these girls, but what we do at Carmen Nirvana, what we advocate on our helpline is that we give them options, we give them choices, and what we try to do is liberate them to make decisions that they want to make for themselves, whatever that decision is. There were a number of investigative failings in Banaz Mahmood, for example, and also in the Sergeant Atwal case, because the cases were reported to the police and no action was taken. Um, it wasn't appreciated how serious the cases were, and in the case of Banaz Mahmood, that she was in imminent danger. Um, at the time, there wasn't nationally rolled out training for investigators and prosecutors, but th there is training now for everyone involved at a police level. Now, Iram, um, we saw in your documentary there's the mention of two very high-profile mm -hmm. cases, cases that were in the media. But I, th I think the, the first question is, how common is the issue of forced marriages and honour killings in the UK? It's more common than you think. It happens so much, you know, for the millions of cases that are in the public eye, there's five million that aren't even reported. Mm -hmm. We've seen an honour killing, we've seen th two high profile honour killings this year. How many we've seen, there are so many that we've seen that haven't even been reported. 
you know, these things are very, very underground. They, they, don't, they don't come to the surface. People hide them very well. Honor killings are organized crime. They mm -hmm. are very well hidden. They only are found out and they're only exposed when something goes wrong. For example, with Banaz Mahmood, the only reason that her killers got caught was because of um, was because of the fact that she went to the police a few weeks before right. and she said to them, they're going to kill me. And she sent a letter to the police with the names of the, her potential killer. Okay. She said, I know these people are going to kill me. And the police found that letter after her death and then they tracked down those victims. I, I mean, sorry. The I'm perpetrators, sorry. right? The perpetrators. So yeah. had it not been for that letter, had it not been for her going to the police, that would have probably never been found out? No. Because her family did not report her missing. No one, her boyfriend reported her missing a few days later. And even then, the only reason the police took notice was because she was already in their record as making several complaints that she was, she was scared she was going to die. Right. But many, many people don't actually get to the point of reporting anything, right? No. Uh, we can see the numbers that you showed us through the, the documentary, but as we were talking about before we started um, this interview, there's many, many more people who don't even report. But, I mean, we discussed why, but do you want to tell the public why many people are afraid to, um, to report or they think that it's not no point in reporting? Mm -hmm. What is it? I think it's a few things. The first thing is there is a very strong sense of family loyalty and, you know, going to the police is, is seen as breaking that loyalty. You're betraying your family, you're mm -hmm. going to the police, you're okay. going to social services, you're... You're, you're stepping outside of that close-knit circle. And that in itself is a crime. You know, by doing that, you're shaming the family. Okay. Second, there's a mistrust of the police. As we can see, the police didn't do much in these two cases that have mm -hmm. been shown. Mm -hmm. But there are so many cases where the police have failed. They've failed or they've just done things wrong and they've included family members that shouldn't be there in the statements and they shouldn't be there in court and they've put the victims in more danger right. and the police have had a lot of failings and right. there's a mistrust because they've had failings and because they don't go about it the right way because they don't know enough. They need no, to I have mean, more I'm knowledge. asking you this because many people might be watching us and saying and thinking, oh, why don't they just go to the police? So there's much more... Yeah. To, to this than just going to the police or anyone. And, and is this something that is linked more to a specific culture, for example? I mean, the, those two women mentioned there, they were from a specific background. Is it more linked to a specific background or is this something that happens in a broader spectrum with different cultures but people don't really talk about it? It happens through certain cultures more. It's, you know, 40% of these honor killings happen in Pakistan and India because it's a tribal practice. It happens in... It happens in Iraq, it happens in Pakistan, it happens in Bangladesh, it happens in Turkey, it happens in places where tribal customs are the norm. In places like the West, where obviously our cultures have developed and we've had migration, we've had people developing the country and everything's changed. It's different, but in places where they're very cl close knit and they're very set in their ways, these mm -hmm. things aren't going to change overnight. You know, the tribal practices, they used to happen to Assyrian women in you know, thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. up until 30 years ago in Italy, it was legal to kill a woman if she'd embarrassed you in Italy, which is a Western progressive country. Wow. So it's not something that's limited or exclusive to any culture right. in religion, you know, in uh, the Sikh religion, in the Hindu religion, in the Muslim religion, killing is forbidden. You're not supposed to kill anyone, especially on children. Right. Of all things that you can do, killing is the worst thing you can do. And I think just to pick up on, on Elena's point that she mentioned, I think this is the most important point we, we want to f um, end the interview with. If someone is right now in a position where they're being pressurized to marry someone or they're being threatened that if they don't marry someone or if they don't make the marriage work that, mm -hmm. you know, they'll be killed or there'll be consequences, what can they do? Who should they speak to? I mean, I know that like Elena said, obviously you should go to the police or you should go to someone, but then there's that thought that you are betraying your family. Black and white, what should be done if a person's in that situation? You have to think about yourself. You have to be selfish in this kind of situation. You can't think about what will my family think. You have to put that out of the window. You have to think, what can I do for myself? If you can't go to the police, go to a charity. Social media is in our faces all the time. All you need to do is pick up your phone, Facebook, 
Twitter, Instagram, there are helplines mm -hmm. everywhere. You don't even need to make a phone call. You can just text someone saying, I'm in trouble. You know, there are charities that will do, that will help you discreetly. There are mm -hmm. charities that there specialize are- Specialized in this kind of yep, there are situation. there are so many charities that are specialized in helping women who are at risk of forced marriage. The forced marriage unit itself, that is a national unit mm -hmm. that works alongside the police. Okay. If you are in danger of a forced marriage, you call up the forced marriage unit, they see what they can do. Mm -hmm. There are so many options to you, but the main option is you just have to forget what everyone else thinks and just worry about yourself. And, and, and just talk about it with someone, right? That's yes, the first step. Exactly. Talk about it. If, you're, if your parents are pressuring you, talk to a sibling. If your siblings are pressuring you, talk to a friend. Talk to anyone who can provide any kind of help. Mm -hmm. Teachers, colleagues, peers. Yeah, There's yeah. so Even many GP people. GP these days. Your GP, exactly. You can, you can go to someone, anyone, yeah. and they, they will realise that right. this is putting you in danger and they will try and get you out. Okay. Iram, thank you so much for being here and talking about no this problem. sensitive subject and congratulations on your documentary. Thank, thank you. you so much for well allowing done. us to, to use it on our program. <laughs> thank you. Indeed. Now, thank if you. you are going through something of this nature and you need to talk to someone, at the end of the program we'll be putting some very important telephone numbers and contacts for organizations that can help you if you are going through this. Don't yes. go anywhere. Also visit our YouTube channel um, and you will have the whole documentary there you can watch leave your comments and please remember to share, okay? Wow, it was great meeting Iram Essen and you know, she was telling us about how difficult it is to get people to come forward mm -hmm. and talking about this subject. I think even people who have moved forward and have new lives, uh, they find it really difficult to talk about this mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Well, they, they, she's obviously trying to raise awareness through her work and she's very passionate about it. And I think it's a really good work to do mm -hmm. because as many people, maybe your neighbor is going through this and you don't even know. You know, there's, there are a lot of people these days. That's right. And we hope that, we hope that this program can help you or maybe a loved one, a friend to overcome a difficult situation they may be going through to do it today's topic. Now, after the break, we'll see this week's trip for two, and we'll also have our advice on uh, this whole situation of forced marriages, and also some key contacts. If you are going through problem, a problem similar to this, you can find help with the contacts for the organizations we'll be giving you later on. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. We hope you're enjoying the program and remember you can get in touch with us sending us an email to questions at lovetalkshow.tv and we will answer your questions here on this program. Or if you want to have a one-to-one -one with us and you're going through a difficult moment in your life and you need some specific advice, write to us again on the same email address and we'll be happy to arrange an appointment with you. Get in touch. Welcome back. We've been talking about forced marriages and honor killings. And mm -hmm. I want to thank our guests for being yeah. on the show today, Shazia Hobbs and Iram Issen. But here's what we have to say about this whole topic. We need to make a very clear point right from the beginning mm -hmm. that we have very little experience on this subject. But of course, based on everything that was said here today by our guests and through the experience in giving advice and guidance to other couples, this can help us offer some limited instruction to people in this situation. It would be obvious for us to say that you shouldn't allow anyone to pressure you into marrying or starting a relationship with anyone you don't want to. But this doesn't always work. It can be very difficult not to give in to pressures when it comes from people you love and trust, like family. Indeed. And it can be very difficult to say no to someone who has cared for you and protected you all your life. And this is why talking to someone else can be so crucial in moments like this. Talking to someone, just, just think about that. Just, just talk, don't worry about what the person will say back, if they'll understand. Just make it known that you're going through a problem. Yeah, and if you are in this situation, do try to speak to people who will be neutral regarding your problem. But that will listen, this is important, that will listen to you and offer some advice. You will see on the screen the contact information for some organizations that can help you if you are currently under the stress of a forced marriage. That's right. One of the things that prevent people in this situation to seek help is because they don't want to hurt 
or disappoint their family. Mm -hmm. But you need to remember that your life and happiness are important and they should be yours to decide what you do with it. Yeah, many times it's also because of fear. Yes. You know, people are often afraid as well. But talking to someone or seeking help does not mean you love your family any less. Mm -hmm. And you would be surprised how just opening up to someone can already make things look clearer and the burden lighter. I want you to think about this. Yeah. Now, we hope that this program today really helped you if you are in this situation. And remember, you don't have to go through this alone. But ultimately, the important thing to remember is that the decision is yours. No one can make this decision for you. You know, we can give you the best advice in the world. People can support you and encourage you. But ultimately, it comes down to you what you decide to do. Yeah. Now, you're going to get to see a couple a lot more often here in this program who will be doing the dates for us. Every week, you'll get to see Tapio and Yasmin trying different things, fun activities, fun dates that you can do either on a first date, 10th date, 1,000th date, it doesn't matter. If you've been married for 50 years, keep dating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed, my lovely husband. <laughs> anyway, let's she's, see. She's sending me a, a message, <laughs> an undercover message. No, I'm not. Now, let's see what they got up to in this week's Trip for Two. Trip for two. I'm Yasmin and I'm Tapiwa um, and we're really excited to be here today and Olgate we're here at the Sozai cooking school and it's, it's such an honor to be here today because I never thought I was going to be uh, actually learning how to make sushi ever in my life but we're here today um, thanks to our amazing you know cooking instructor Izzy. Uh, Izzy Hello. could you please introduce yourself to the yeah, viewers sure, and you know and what course, we're going to yeah. be making today. Very nice to meet you too. Yeah. Thank you. And we Suzai, uh, the first Japanese cooking school in London and we're going to, we got various of Japanese sushi class, all sort of family favourite traditional uh, cooking classes and today we're going to show you how to do the sushi. Do you know any Japanese? <laughs> um, I only know how to say hello and thank you and good night. Okay, go on then. Kumbawa. Arigato <laughs> 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 So Yeah. And konnichiwa. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So what sushi are we going to make today? Yeah, you're going to make two different rolls using this nori. Okay. Nice. And the one is called uramaki, which is inside the out roll. Oh, nice. And then a famous uh, California roll, if you know about it. Yeah. I've heard about mm. it. Yeah. I believe it. Okay. <laughs> And another one is going to be giant roll, the okay. big chunky roll. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Sounds Have like more said? my kind of, you know. Yeah, okay, <laughs> excellent. Have you cooked the rice before? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we've cooked rice, but probably not, not in, like the, this. Sushi in rice. the same way. Yes. Yeah, sushi rice. You need to uh, choose the sushi rice, short grain, Japanese sticky rice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you oh. can't make with uh, jasmine rice or basmati rice. Oh, okay. Yeah, Japanese yeah. sushi rice. So how and did you prepare it to oh, get yeah, to this stage? Good question. You need to wash first, pour in the water. That's cold water. And as you've seen, it's quite milky, white water is coming. It's this nuka, lots of starches. We need to wash this off for okay. sushi rice. If you have got a rice cooker, just press the button. But um, if you cook rice in a pan, you need to measure rice in the water. Let's say if you are measuring raw rice in a cup, mm -hmm. volume wise, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly the same volume. And you wash, drain, wash, drain several times. And adding the water, exactly the same volume, plus 10%. Cook. Okay, then you start cooking, start boiling and the reach boiling point, reduce the heat the lowest, simmer for 13 to 15 minutes, okay. yeah. steal it on, leave it another 13 to 15 minutes okay. to steam. Also, just to be clear, you said we start with cold water in the, in the frying pan? Yeah, in the, in the pan. pan. 
Yeah, cooked. Okay. Okay. Quite straightforward. And then once you cooked, <coughs> you got to mix with sushi rice vinegar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's already made one, or you can make your own recipe. Sushi rice vinegar you use about just touch and a quarter for the raw rice to mix with it. Yeah? Okay. Just mix when rice is too hot. Yeah, we've done it for you today, so I'm not so worried about okay, it. Great. <laughs> but this is sushi rice ready to roll. Okay, so this is the outcome. Marinated after we do the... oh, already. Wow. And we have, we have got nori, seaweed vegetable. And we have got lovely fresh ingredients. We have got lettuce, cucumber, peppers, shred carrot, and egg omelette. Kampyo, which is vegetable, marinated with soy sauce and mirin, quite nice and sweet, and a tofu curd. And salmon, prawn, avocado curry, which is ginger, and a wasabi. And these colourful fish eggs are tobiko. Do you know about tobiko? No, yeah. it looks like caviar. Like <laughs> yeah, a fish caviar, caviar obviously. Caviar. Yeah, yes. uh, flying fish roll. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yellow one is yuzu flavour. Yuzu, Japanese lemon. Okay. Yeah, very nice. And ordinarily just orange, bright, really orange bright colour. And wasabi. We also have got quite fancy pink rice today, oh. which is a tiny bit of beetroot oh, nice. juice. I was wondering what it was in there actually, how you made it pink, but okay. Yeah, just food colour. Oh, nice. <laughs> and lost its sesame seed. Help you with us? Okay. Okay, excellent. Let's roll. So you saw Tapio and Yasmin doing a little bit of preparation for sushi in a it's few weeks. It's hard work, huh? it's, hard it's hard work. work. In a few weeks you'll see them actually making the sushi. Now we've had a lot of action type date ideas recently for you to try out, but cooking can also be a great way for you and your loved one to spend time together. Even if it's a date, a first date, even better, you can use this time to also get to know each other. Mm -hmm. And you know, cooking is very physical, you get to to touch the person. I mean, when you cook, when Elena cooks, or if you I You don't cook, touch anything, my we darling. We don't really touch anything. Well, but we don't touch anything. <laughs> I touch but, everything, the pots and pans afterwards. But, <laughs> but if you're going on a date, it's a, a double experience. So you get to interact with each other and so on, right? Yeah, and that might be the only time your partner will cook. <laughs> but anyway, what you just saw was the preparation of the ingredients that they will be using in the sushi class that you will see next week, which takes time to do. Now you'll get to see a lot more of this couple cooking in the upcoming weeks at the Sozai School. And there'll also be a challenge for Tapio and Yasmin, so make sure you don't miss those. And of course, thank you to the Sozai School for having us. Now back to today's topic, if you'd like help and information or if you are in any danger, please contact the forced marriage unit on the number below or the police. Yeah. And of course, you can also contact us and we can help you also. Just email us at questions at lovetalkshow.tv and we will get back to you. Thankfully, there are dozens of organizations that can provide assistance and support to anyone at risk. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. We want to thank our guests for being on the show. Yes. And if you've been affected by anything said here today, please do get in touch. We'd love to help you. Until next time, bye bye. Bye. We think that the problem is actually deeper and more serious and, and more and more and more and more. Absolutely. Now, let's head over to our Love Talk correspondent, Jenny Cortez Ibanez. Ibanez. And that's exactly why in our marriage course we always say that you don't, 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 don't. <laughs> And you will be able to, oh, not, um, not able. Changing the mood, changing the a gear up or two. Well, this research is According to a recent study by Sofa Company, distinctive chest, okay. And there will also be a challenge for our two students, Tapio and Yasmin, to make sure. So, uh. <clears throat> and also, you can remember that you can contact what? Hi guys, we sorry. Hi guys, welcome to Trip for Two. I'm Yasmin, and I'm Tapio, 
and today we're really excited because we're here at the Kozai um, cooking class. So oh. says Kozai. Ah. And that's all for today's Love Talk show. Be sure to tune in next week to learn more on how to love intelligently.